with Project Momentum. If everybody could get seated, please. Thank you. All right, we are um, going to begin this with about 30 minutes covering the information, and then we should have about 30 minutes to allow questions. All right, go ahead. And my goal is to do such a good job, there's no 30 minutes for questions. Okay. Okay, miracles do happen. So um, I think S Scott did a wonderful job articulating earlier um, really the some of the finer points of why we need to do this and how it is incorporated deeply with the presentation that you just saw. So first I wanted to introduce um, our wonderful principals that are here with us today. We have Kathleen Quigley, Marie Lemon, Eric McCann and Matt Eline, so our three association um, heads. And we also had um, scheduled uh, to join us was Meryl Dade, who's our principal of the year. She's home uh, quite ill. And then Penny Gross was here, but she had to, to, she stayed as long as she could, but we ran over a little bit. So she had to, uh, had to leave for a school event. So I wanted to have um, cross representation of not only all the regions, but also um, just different types of schools represented. Um, so that was the intent um, today. So we've had a couple people leave, but I think um, the principals here can certainly speak to um, any questions or concerns um, that board members may raise um, in the question period. Um, as we go through, I wanted to start out with just kind of, and we've all had this conversation in the two by two, so some of this is a repeat. Um, again, very supportive. Um, I personally want to thank each and every member of the board um, for your support of this. You guys have been incredibly positive and supported this initiative over the last four years. Um, and again, this is just kind of hopefully more of the same, but even more focused um, and will support more schools. So with that, we wanted to make sure we tied it to um, the one Fairfax policy, and that hopefully is gonna be one of our guiding lenses as we go through um, in the future with Fairfax. And then we wanted to make sure that we tied it to our um, excellence, equity, and effectiveness lens in all areas. Um, as you can see, um, you know, we wanna be the premier school system. We must continue to find ways to be very strategic with that. How are we isolating areas where we're not growing as well as we should? How do we take the lessons learned from whether it's project momentum, um, the closing the achievement gap framework or anything else and, uh, got it, I was too close, I'm too loud, and move that. Um, and then obviously our equity um, lens and supporting the new SOA adjustments. Um, and I actually, there was a change in the excellence bullet. So I was working from two different laptops and clearly I screwed up. So I apologize um, that that's change is not in there. So this is the original presentation. Um, so that just caught me off guard. Sorry about that. Um, and then effectiveness, um, obviously we want to look at what is, what is the winning formula? What are we doing? What do we know works? How do we replicate that and expand that? to all schools, and I think you're gonna hear about that um, today as we go through this. So one of the things we wanna do is look at our needs-based staffing allocations, um, and the two changes that we would be proposing are changing um, our staffing formula in terms of our office assistant calculation, and then we would look at, in addition to that, raising um, the floor for needs-based staffing. So the two, basic shifts, um, as you can see, they're not significant shifts um, in terms of affecting a, a large number of schools. As a matter of fact, um, the calculation of shifting from 20 to 25 percent poverty affected 13 schools. Five of those schools actually would have been brand new schools um, to receive needs-based staffing um, next year. And that is a, an important point for people to keep in mind because as our demographics change and our poverty rate changes, then that's going to increase the cost um, of needs-based staffing and is something that um, is going to happen over time. In addition, those schools at the higher end, as they move up 
you know, that, that needs-based staffing calculation um, is exponential, and those schools will qualify for more needs-based staffing. So um, in, in really looking at this at a, at a pretty detailed level, I think this is a very prudent recommendation for the board to consider. So the office support staffing, we want to try to um, align elementary, middle, and high school office support staffing. Um, and it also refines our approach to make sure that needs-based staffing is going to classroom-based activities and classroom teachers. Um, currently, we spend um, a pretty significant amount of money on office assistants um, at the elementary level. And because they are staffed by the number of teachers in a building, so the more needs-based staffing you get, the more teachers you get, therefore the more office assistants that you qualify. Um, for and if you look at the impact of that, you know, basically we would have five again going back to the five new schools that would be coming in Those schools would also qualify for more office assistant staffing and if you talk to those schools they really didn't affect their um, Their performance last year. They weren't calling asking for you know Everybody could use more staffing in any area But I think if you look at things like the past Gibson report and other things there were some recommendations for us to um, look at our elementary office um, staffing um, and, and do it in a more equitable manner and, and make some reasonable um, Cuts to that so I think that this takes that into account So what are our you know, we heard a little bit of a discussion earlier, and as kind of the hopefully the academic um, tip of the spear, so to speak, what are the things that we really focus on in our office to help really drive improvement in schools? And you know, the, these are the things that we believe and, and we've seen over the last four years. They're all research based. Um, they are highly aligned with the work in um, instructional services, and basically, you know, high performing collaborative teams high quality tier one instruction, a really tight lesson plan aligned to the state standards, which is one of the things that we led years in advance with our learn model and that the state looks at, at copying us. But again, it's how do you get that implemented with fidelity across the system when you don't have enough people to do that? And that's always the challenge um, in Fairfax. Um, formative assessments, and I'm not talking about more testing, right? It can be exit tickets. There's all kinds of different ways to assess students in a really, really positive way, but we need to make sure that those short formative cycle assessments are happening so teachers can change in real time their instructional practices to make sure that all kids are getting what they need and then having a really tight response to intervention um, protocol in all schools where kids that are struggling get immediate assistance retaught reassessed and then we move them forward you think about you know, just a concept like mathematics and where they don't get those foundational building blocks and, and the lesson is moving on and, and the, the learning continues for a large number and those gaps increase because we, we don't necessarily circle back um, with the tight response to instruction program that, that we're finding um, certainly in our Project Momentum schools and some of our other schools um, in the county that have a really tight process, um, they, they have a really good achievement results and that's certainly what we wanna replicate um, throughout the system. So then, and I'll come back to this at the end because that's probably what we'll spend the most time with. Um, so this is what the structure would look like. Um, certainly all the, the board has seen it. We did add um, the positions from uh, Francisco's presentation in here so you could see kind of what the representation looks like. And the one thing I want to explain on this that's a really important point is that while there's regional teams, so there would be people from the Office of School Supp Support assigned to regions as a priority. As a system perspective, we would use all those people to continue to support our intensive and targeted schools. That's very, very important um, because there are great needs in regions two and three specifically, and they happen to have the majority of schools that are intensive. We certainly would not expect the same number of people to support um, just those, those two regions. So there will be some cross um, work of the folks 
that are identified above. And I think that will actually lead to greater collaboration within FCPS. Um, and it will make us more tightly aligned. And when we get to that fidelity, fidelity of implementation, whether it's uh, tier one instruction, um, high performing teams, the more we can do that with a group of people that's greatly connected, the more we can ensure that all kids are getting that. We've been talking about professional learning communities in this, which I am probably one of the biggest believers of because I've seen the results. And still in this county, it's not consistent in our schools. And we know it works. And it, it's not that people are trying not to do it. It's just it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of monitoring and it takes people that know how to do it to get it in schools. And um, we want to be tight about that because we know that's going to be the key driver for improving um, student, student performance. So just a couple highlights. Um, again, these are all things that we talked about. Um, we're going to continue to serve our intensive and targeted schools. We believe that it will um, increase the capacity um, to really serve as a regional deployment um, model, much like what Scott highlighted earlier um, during Francisco's presentation, to really give regions um, access to the resources that they need to help target the schools that they know best. Um, and I think that we have um, two great RAS in the back that can certainly um, talk to that if, if questions arise um, or how they may do that. Um, I think one of the things we have to get serious about, and it was it, gratifying to hear the earlier conversation as someone who over 10 years ago applied for um, some of the extended the earliest extended contracts our our platform and our project at Thoreau Middle School was eliminating achievement gaps and that's what we wrote our grant for and that's what we we received it for and because of the resources I received we eliminated them um, and it was a, a great deal of work. Every subgroup, every subgroup, including special ed, performed above 90% over the, over the time that was implemented. But we had very targeted resources, we had a lot of great people, and it worked. And we need to make sure we're talking about how do we truly close achievement gaps and, and what can we do to ensure that? And I think this work is gonna help us um, make that. That's probably, I think, some of the most passionate work I have. And when we get to the achievement gap conversation, I wanna get after the real achievement gaps because one of the things we look at um, with the new state metrics are that once you hit above 75%, they in their world, you've closed the achievement gap, so you're gonna show up green. So believe it or not, you could have like be performing at 75% and 90 and they would think, oh, well, there's no gap there. There's a heck of a gap there. And um, Dr. Brabrandt has made it very clear to us that he expects those gaps to be eliminated as well. And I certainly applaud him for that. And I believe this will help us to really get to the heart of how do you, how do, you do that work. And then um, last, I think it will allow us to be much the way it's constructed, and, and I think back to kind of the old area days for those of us that have been around, I really do believe that this is going to allow us to do a lot more collaboration in terms of the different area, the different offices within our system. So we talked about special ed quite a bit before. Special ed, there's going to be a special ed person on each one of these teams that is staffed through. Teresa Johnson's um, office. That's going to really allow us to make sure we have a good focus on special ed students. We've never done that before. We have, you know, I meet regularly with instructional services and Sloan's team. Those people are, are those folk were, were integrated with each other in the work that we do. We just try to to get to more schools. There's just not enough of us, you know. There, there, that's the biggest challenge, even with this. And people will look and say, oh, well, that's an expansion. It is, but people forget there's 200 schools and a whole lot of people you got to help. And so our folks can spend an inordinate amount of time in just one or two schools um, with some struggling teachers or some struggling teams. And you don't want to abandon them. You want to keep helping them and, you, and, and make them better. And so I think the, strug the struggle is going to be how do we serve as many schools as possible? And I think this is, is absolutely um, 
the right work. Um, and I think I, you know, I'm just passionate about it. I've seen the results, and, and it's going to make a difference. Um, lastly, uh, before we go back, um, this is what the savings um, that we looked at. And again, it's approximate um, because once final numbers come in, and so that's how we would fund um, not only the expansion in uh, project momentum, but obviously some of the supports that um, Francisco presented earlier. So in a nutshell, that's it. And Ms. Gross walked in, so she didn't desert me. So come on up. No, no, she, she's going to come and so. So if I us. could, before the board takes questions, the what? is taking something that you've had now for four years through the Office of School Support and Project Momentum results. You've had results. You've been updated each year, and it's been a smaller subset of schools. We're going to take it to scale across the whole division. We're going to have, in, in each of those regions, the equity person you just heard from from Francisco, the special ed person, and then content specialist science, English, social studies, math. All of that is a team to give the regions power to implement with fidelity what? How are you going to do it? You're taking needs-based staffing. Look, let's be honest. Anything around budget staffing, it makes people ask questions. We've had the same formula for 15 years. Part of needs-based staffing has been office staffing because when you got more teachers, you got an additional office. Whether you think that's great or not great, is that the driver that's going to get us from point A to point B? Right? Same schools, but because some might have had more teachers, they then got more office. That's where two million's coming. One million is going from 20% to 25. We called all the principals. Mark's talked with them in advance. I mean, no one wants to hear that they might have a little bit, but we've capped it, I think, at the loss of one, no more than one teacher, Mark, correct? And we need to move the needle. So we, we brought you the what? We brought you the how. We brought you the principles. Um, I do think I'm not going all the way back to the 80s to do the area. They were they were too much and too big, and there were four systems. Mark reports to the deputy, but he works collaboratively with the regions and with Francisco's team. We're really going to become a collaborative team as a school district. We've asked teachers to do collaboration. We haven't, as a district school system, done that same level of collaboration. And that's what we're asking ourselves, making ourselves do now to then drive results at schools for kids. So I really want to applaud Mark and his team. I want to applaud the principals for um, their support. I want to applaud Francisco and Steve for working together and saying, can we just tweak, tweak one, three, four percent of a formula to get something that we know is working and do it better. And what you'll hear to, in April next month, any school in yellow, we're gonna have to have a district response to. Who are we gonna send? Are we gonna pull them off intensive schools? No, we're not. So we had to come up with something, and I think this is taking the best of everything I've seen in seven months. Could there still be additional collaboration between departments and schools and Office of School Support to do in the years to come? Yes, yes, indeed. But I don't have all that today. I do have a formula that works, taking it to scale and doing it with the least impact to the system as possible. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get started with Ms. Karen Corbett Sanders. Thank you. And thank you, Mark, uh, to you and your whole team for all the work that you have done over the past four years and for all the work you're going to do in the future. We really appreciate it. Um, and I welcome this very intentional s focus on um, support to each of the regions. I think that's a good idea. Um, I do have a couple of questions because actually, Dr. Brabrand, you mentioned it. The old area model created four separate um, systems within Fairfax County. And to a certain extent, my biggest fear is that we are creating five separate systems in the county with this model. And um, that is because of the way our regions are currently carved up. You mentioned, uh, Mark, that two of our regions have the concentration of our high needs and our poverty. Um, and if I remember correctly, and the regions were developed before I came on the board, but they were intentionally 
structured that way to concentrate our high need schools in in no that's what i was told but okay maybe i'm wrong well it, but it's not geographic because i have schools in region 4 the region 4 is a very elongated long region um, region three is much more compact in its geography and it's more compact in its needs. And so what I'm going to ask is if we can please relook at those regions in a way, because if we're giving the exact same team level of support in each individual region, then we might want to balance the workload within the regions to make sure that we don't have all of our Title I schools in um, or the ninety percent of our Title One schools in two regions, and the rest uh, just in a few other places in pockets, uh, because I think it is important that we have this focused approach, but we also want to make sure that we um, have a more balance. And it, and frankly, I think that when you do that, you also have that shared accountability across regions, because it's then becomes somebody else, everybody has a little bit of the problem. It's part of that equity piece. Um, and then I do, do have one question regarding your, you have $3.2 million is what you've um, been able to pull together between the needs-based staffing for uh, front office support. And uh, was it more than just front office support? I thought it was also, um, you know, we have custodial support based on the number of teachers. And, huh? Uh, so custodians are part of that formula, um, but we did not touch them because Mr. Plattenberg would not be very happy with me. Um, there, there is a lot of reasons we just didn't get into that, to be honest, at, at this point. The, there, the custodians is much more spread out. Okay. Um, but it, it, there, there, it, there is there is funding that is currently from needs-based staffing that is spent on custodians, and I think obviously that you know things like that can be looked at down the road but it's not as significant as the office assistance and it's it's not concentrated in just a few schools it's much more spread out and jeff could probably speak to that better than better I, than i could i would presume it's because they're taking up more square footage if you have uh more classroom space being and trailers and, and trailers than you have a requirement but i know that we're going to be asked that question so it would be helpful to have an answer to okay. it um, and, you know, just once again, if we can look at uh, our regions, I think that would be helpful. Um, and I do support what you're doing. I think it's a uh, great focus, especially on making sure that we have fidelity of implementation. And I can see you and Dr. Duran working very closely together because they are hand in hand in equity. Thank you. And we'll make sure we do that. And we'll you know, I think the board, the region look is something that, you know, I think that's a, a certainly a, a board and um, Dr. Brabrandt um, conversation. Rest assured on the two points, we're going to make sure that our most intensive schools receive the same level of support regardless of where they've, what region they're in that they've been getting. That is uh, one of the things that Dr. Brabrandt made very clear. Regardless of what we do, our most intensive schools are going to get the same support they've got. So again, there will be while you, while when you look at it again there's there's you know there's people assigned to each region please understand and that's why they are going to be um, centrally there's central oversight to ensure that we can move people around to support needs across the system that's definitely going to happen thank you uh, next we have uh, Ms. Evans and then Mr. Moon uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank you for all the work that, that all of you have done on uh, this proposal, and uh, pr Project Momentum has been highly successful, so congratulations to, to all of you um, on, on, um, on that success. Um, I have several questions um, with the office staffing. I do remember the Gibson report suggesting this. Is it, uh, is it correct that all of these changes will come from our high-needs schools because of the because of the form formula? No, the formula affects 
all elementary <clears throat> schools, so it does not just affect our high need schools. As a matter of fact, that's why um, we have some representation here. Okay. So, for example, um, you know, Kathleen School is, is not necessarily a high need school, but she would be losing a 0.5 um, office staffing, um, and so that's. You know, it's going to, okay. it, it's, it's because it's a formula change. Correct. It's not going to be driven by the number of teachers anymore. It's going to be more in line with middle and high school where it's based on your, your enrollment. Mm -hmm. There is okay. a small factor that they put in to account for our more needy schools, a very slight um, adjustment, but for the most part, it, it's much more even and much more equitable. And so it's, I would say probably more schools that are, um, Many schools that are at the high end are going to be affected, and our low end of poverty um, are going to be affected as well. So, is uh, the standard that no school will lose more than one staff? Is that also true of the office staffing formula change? That's a good question. That I did not. Um, I know that for most schools, and looking at it, it was a 0 0.5. 0 .5. There were a few that um, had a 1.0. I'll go back and look I don't, okay. I, and get you that answer. I'd be interested if, if there was anybody who, who lost more than one position of, of office staffing. I, um, I do support what you're doing here. This, um, um, I think that uh, while nobody is going to want to lose office staff, it's, it's better than um, what might have been considered in, in terms of uh, losing uh, teaching staff or teaching assistants. I think that the uh, going to 25% makes sense 25 percent is still below average in terms of in, in terms of um frm uh that is in our district uh low poverty school um so uh i think that makes sense to to raise that in order to uh provide more more resources elsewhere am i correct that when you say the intensive and targeted um will they not lose any funding uh, those are intensive in our targeted schools they won't lose any project momentum funding is that correct that's correct we, we int intend on giving them the same support targeted we're going to have to look at um <coughs> this year and I'll, I'll bring that to the board when we come in october um and f i don't know how much yellow we're going to have like i it, like that's going to be a little bit of a uh, of a different paradigm shift for us and so we're we're going to have to figure out that's probably the one group that we'll have to figure out how we identify maybe a little bit differently i think our current metrics are really good they've worked really well mm -hmm. but without seeing what the state is actually what the effect is actually going to have um i think we're going to be able to do all the same support for our targeted schools as as well but i just want to say that with the caveat i want to wait and see what the actual results are so i know we have to deal with with new standards and you know that's important that we do that i just want to make sure that our highest needs schools don't lose as a result of it because that's got to continue to be Ab a, absolutely a focus. we'll ensure that happens and then my um uh, my my biggest question here has to do with needs based staffing and you and i have had a conversation about this with dr lockhart as well and i had a conversation with dr Rain. is he still oh <laughs> hello dr Rain. <laughs> and, and 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 you, and you know what i'm i'm going to ask here because uh, and maybe i misunderstood one thing that i was told but um our needs based staffing is that uh is that formula for lack of a better word sacrosanct if a if a school gets needs based staffing is that a sure thing for them or can they lose it is there flexibility in terms of pulling needs based staffing from a school I'm going to let, um, I, that's a, that's way above my pay grade. I have no, I don't know the answer to that I've never pulled it from anybody. I've never seen it pulled, but I don't know. That's, that's a question for somebody else. Oh, there you, I apologize. I don't have the answer. Dr. Ramey, is that, that's a question for you then. So we don't, I think kind of what you're asking is the interplay between the needs-based staffing and these, um, the class size regulation that we have and that we're utilizing at our schools. And, while needs-based staffing, no, is not pulled back from a school once it's provided, we have gone to an approach where the class size regulation is going to take precedence when we're looking at staffing schools. And so, for example, if by formula, overall from the staffing formula, a school is allocated 25 positions, but when we look at that school in terms of how we staff it, 
based on the class size regulation. And we can staff those classes what's inside the caps using only 24 teachers. We've talked to the principals at the elementary level in the regions that we will pull back a teacher and redeploy that individual to a school that perhaps is outside of the class ride reg or has a vacancy that we need to fill before the first day of school. So a school can lose its needs-based staffing if it's if it doesn't have a need to lower the the top of the if it's if it doesn't go over the cap. That that gives me great concern, as you know. I, I expressed great concern over this. You did, and when when it comes when the staffing's done by do you want to come up here and join me, Alice? Um, when it's done by finance and then the allocations come to us to work with the schools from HR's perspective, we look at what has been allocated through the process to that point. And as I said, um, we then apply the class size regulation over the top of that using those as our guidelines. So let me put it this way. Um, if our needs-based staffing was in policy, would some schools be staffed differently today? Well, probably, I mean, it, it depends um, if, if the class size, I mean, I think, like I said, I think that we have two things, two competing interests that we're trying to get at the same issue over the last couple of years. And as we put them in place, we haven't really looked at how they interact with each other. And so we have this approach with needs-based staffing, then we have this regulation that's embedded in class size. And so while they're both trying to get to the same goal, they end up being kind of competitive at times. And so I, I guess my advocacy would be, if we need to put needs-based staffing into policy, we should put that into policy so the other policy doesn't trump it because we have a long-standing belief in needs-based staffing. And if, if what is in policy is trumping needs-based staffing, then we need to take the action to put it into policy. And I, I, would, I would put that as a, as a next step, but I also, as a next step, would want to know uh, very specifically how many schools have had um, their, uh, their number of uh, positions reduced that normally they would get under needs-based staffing. That I, I, I would like to see that list and how many schools have have lost. I, you know, I, you and I went through uh, okay. class sizes, and we now have some very low poverty schools that have lower class sizes than some of our high poverty schools, and that gives me great. Okay. Problem. So I think she noted your next steps, and Dr. Brabrand. I just to want to say this, and I see Marie wanted to say something. This is a little unrelated to the specific proposal we have on the table. But I would say this, I, I left for five years. You all did something around class size caps and understanding the interaction of that formula and capping and how it drives dollars and needs-based staffing, we need to take a deeper dive. And, and honestly, I'm just, I, I've already told Chase, I wanna look at all of it. I know that may be, oh my goodness, but we need to really understand how both those things have worked. Who have they benefited? Who, how has it been distributed? And I, I think we need to take a deeper reflection. I know we've had the caps now for a couple of years, but I think we need to look through that too with an equity lens and see, and see how it matches up. I don't have that today. That wasn't where we went today with this, but I do think it's a question that's naturally coming up, and it is one we're worthy of uh, exploring and reviewing with you guys. And Marie, did you that? And I think Maria wanted to say something. Oh, thank you. In practice, you know, my school at Bailey's Upper, we are we get a lot of needs-based staffing because we're almost 80% free and reduced lunch, and we also get Title I. And I want to say that I've never negatively been, if, or been hurt by one policy overriding another. I think it really becomes a conversation of just year to year, what does your grade levels look like, and do you need that, you know, eight, well, for me, like eighth teacher, ninth teacher, or can you make it work out with, with the seven that you have, and I think HR has been a good partner in that to say, okay, we're not going to have one policy trump the other, but we're going to see what makes sense to make make the school year work. Thank you. I, I will add one thing to, and I know as Dr. <laughs> Rayburn said, this is off topic, but to, to Sandy's point, and it is looking at all of it because 
what you described there about a low poverty school with the class size is really a result of the class size regulation. And it's really demonstrated by a simple example that if one school had 65 students in a grade level and the other school had 58, it doesn't matter what the poverty levels of those schools are. Right. The one is going to run two classes of 29 and the other, we are going to have to give a third teacher to. And if it happens that the lower poverty is in the school that got 65, right. they would be able to run class sizes at a significantly lower amount than the class than the school that had 58, just because of the way, as Marie said, the students come in grade level. So I think that's why Dr. Braybrand's right. We have to go back and we have to look at it all um, over overall. And I, but I also think uh, just one more point. Uh, big, but what one thing that. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing. Other people have taken 20 minutes in a turn, and this is going to be my last one. All right. And you raised something in our conversation about the impact of having an AAP center there, that, you, that, a cla that one school could get two more positions at one grade level because of AAP. Okay, and, and that, so that truly points out that that's a, a, a different conversation we're gonna have to um, dive into a little bit more. So uh, we have Mr. Moon. Uh, Madam meeting manager, how many minutes do I have? I'm gonna give everybody five minutes. Five minutes, thank mm -hmm. you, I'll be quick. Uh, first of all, I wanna, I wanna start with uh, uh, you know, compliment that that we've done so well with the 30 schools in the year present momentum. And I'm glad that you are trying to scale this to the uh, countywide. Uh, at the same time, I have some areas of concerns or questions at least that from 30 to almost 200, I don't know how many is, will be in yellow uh, with a staff of 18, that's from eight to 18, just adding 10 more positions, you want to scale it to the entire 20 schools. So uh, there's a, uh, that's an area of my concern, whether we have enough position to be able to help all 200 schools, or you're going to just focus on those which are going to be in yellow, number of which we don't know yet. Uh, that's a question and comment. Uh, the second point is where the uh, Ms. Evans uh, expressed her concerns uh, is, you know, for me, when I had that two by two meeting, I didn't quite get the $2.1 million of additional revenue to be generated by adjusting office staffing. That where uh, I have the list of those 13 schools where they may be losing some staffing based upon change and needs based on staffing formula, uh, but I don't know where the other $2.1 million will be coming from. What schools will, will be affected? Uh, Mr. Greenfield, you may not have that information handy, but I would like to have that information. And I, this question goes to uh, Dr. Ramey. Uh, have the schools been given in the past discretions to use their uh, office assistant staffing to convert to teaching positions. Yes, they have. Been. Yes, that was my understanding, which means uh, from those schools who will be affected by losing $2.1 million, how many schools actually converted the office staffing to teachers and then will be losing those teachers because of the change. I want to see those. You want me to yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And, and that's where my concerns are coming from. If the, those schools are used additional office staffing to have a more teachers, now they are gonna lose those teachers. They may be losing those teachers. And how, so I wanna see how these gonna impact those schools. I mean, I applaud you know, your effort to scale this to the countywide to help all schools, especially those in yellow, yellow, which is a reality we have to deal with. But at the same time, I need to have full information. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and um, everybody's going to start off with thank you. This is really important work, and um, I know the community wants us to make investments in what actually moves the needle for kids, and that's what we're doing here, and it's very exciting. Um, I would just mention on slide three um, the language that was changed, and I don't want to dwell on this very at all, really, um, but I think in the that first bullet, the excellence bullet, um, there was a change made, and we all got an email about it, and so that the the, yeah, so what we see actually on our screens takes out that second sentence, which says overall student outcome results have been flat in FCPS over the last three years, and puts in um, a more forward-looking sentence, which I like the sentence that was added, but I would leave that sentence in as well, because I think we need to be honest with the community when we have bad news, too. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why, yeah. Yeah. That, that was my fault from a protocol. So I'm, I'm not, it's this okay. is not my like wheelhouse. So oh. I, I, I wanted to put the change and then I, I, had, I had talked to Scott over the weekend and emailed some stuff and then I put it back. So I'll, Mark, if there's we'll, anybody, we'll fix it. If there's anybody <laughs> whose fault it is not, it's you. So don't yeah. worry. I'll, no, I'll no explanation. It. Next step. Right now. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Got so it. then I want to go to slide seven and um, I just, you know, I have to say as a teacher, um, I would give a lot to have this available to me as an elementary teacher. Mm -hmm. And that would be to have somebody come to my collaborative team meetings, and I'm just maybe just talking about literacy, just talking about language arts. I have collaborative team meetings where we literally have um, ideological debates about what's the best way to teach kids. Uh, what are we, why, how are we doing that at that level? It's, you know, well-meaning people, but we bounce around like billiard balls against each other. We don't have clarity. We don't have guidance. And I work at a wonderful school, absolutely. But this is a consistent thing. When you're in a relatively wealthy county that's well-resourced, you've got this great buffet of initiatives and programs and stuff, but there's just not enough guidance. Guidance, I don't think, at the local level about what good practice looks like in the classroom for kids. And if you're able to do that, and this is why I want to visit and see uh, one of these project management schools and see how it works. Because um, if, if you're able to go into schools and uh, have credibility and trust with the teachers and sit down in collaborative team meetings and um, get teachers to help create what that looks like with guidance. Um, I think I think that's the that is the best practice, and probably is why we're doing so well. So, thank you. Okay. Penny or Marie, do you want to say anything? Both of you were nodding. Do you want to talk about the power of what Pat just said from that principal teacher perspective? I'll just say, when I first got to Stewart, we were warned in math, um, and so there was a big team there, and we had someone. I'll just give him a shout out, Charles Hom, who was amazing um, and was a math resource coming into our school. And it's hard to come into high school math department as an outsider and get people to trust you and believe that you're there to help. Um, and honestly, Stuart got out of accreditation with warning in large part. I mean, our teachers work very hard, um, but Charles and the entire support team was there working with us as one team. Um, and I've worked in schools that have needed turnaround, and I would say this Project Momentum model has really been exceptional in helping us to turn outcomes around for kids in a very short period of time. Thank you. If you're done. Oh, sure. Elementary story, because we were in a similar situation with special education math, and our scores were just probably some of the lowest ever. And that quickly, we were able to get um, folks from the special ed department. I was able to get my teachers trained in different uh, tier three programs, such as Number World. And the last, the last day that Fabio sent me, we were like above our projection for uh, special ed mathematics. Okay, thank you. Ms. Schultz? So um, a couple of things. I appreciate you bringing up that last part about the special ed because um, for the longest time, my, my focus on the orange line um, that's been at the bottom um, has also been sort of colored by the fact that we throw everything of special ed into that one line. And, and I really do think that part of the work of this group has got to be differentiating between, you know, a, a nonverbal, you know, spectrum student in a classroom, um, in a, in a, in a self-contained classroom versus a student that has dyslexia. That they're all in that same line, and it's not fair because it doesn't. It, we're not fairly um, disaggregating 
you know, sort of a tiered, you know, level of student within that. And student growth progression has got to be, you know, the, the scattergrams have got to come. And so my question is to the, to the principals that are here, are, are you feeling like you're getting information now that is, is going to help in this work? Because it's one thing to say, you knew, you knew where the problem was in math. I mean, that was made abundantly clear to you. I don't know if you have the same problem or you if, if you have the same problem, if you were able to say and differentiate, look, you, you have students that are doing pretty well, but the doing pretty well students, you know, that's that 75% that you talked about, like, eh, well, you know, everybody's green, it's all good. No, not really. So that's, that's a question that any principals that want to tackle, Ms. I have Schultz, a question. She wanted to respond earlier, so she wants to address your statement. I, th I threw the tennis ball over that, their net. They can decide who hits back. Your question is really timely because um, I'm at a school where our students do really well, and yet we have a high percentage of students in our special education population. And um, because of the support of Dr. Zulwaga and looking at the data across Region 2, we're able to see that there's a Title I school that was really hitting it out of the park with their special education students in math. And so, you know, kind of we stumble upon it sometimes as principals and we have help, but, you know, my school's not a school that would be targeted for specific supports and interventions. But because of this, I sent a team over to Bryn Mawr Park and they came over so excited about what we can do with our special needs students in mathematics. So that's my answer to Ms. Evans um, on the issue of, you know, do you lose a, a front office staff or you lose a, I, I've always been bothered by the fact that we say a higher poverty school gets more janitors. I just don't even like that on its face. I know that you're gonna, you can add something else, but I'm just gonna say though, targeting the money, we've had needs-based staffing forever. It hasn't moved the needle, it hasn't moved the needle. So. So if we wind up moving the needs-based staffing to targeted needs and driving achievement, now you're prioritizing where the money goes and you're making a difference. Instead of, well, we have a formula and you get an extra person in the front office and you get an extra janitor. and That's not, that doesn't work anymore. It, ne it never has worked and we have years of data to show. And now you should see something like this or something like this and you say, money to specific areas of specific need in specific schools, then you're, then now you're, Mr. Eline. No, Mark, Mark told me I had to talk, so I'm going to. Um, listen, I watched what Mark was doing and I look, watched what Penny did and Marie did at their schools. And I said, why can't we do that at Robinson? We still have groups, special ed, ESOL students, that we have gaps. And I wanted to know what they were doing. So I went to Mark, I sat down with him, and he was gracious enough to talk to me, give me a little staffing, like a, not much, but he gave me a little, uh, I wanted more. Here's what we've done. Our ESOL students for the first time went to our homecoming dance. They went to football games. You know what we did? We stopped ignoring them. We made them part of Robinson. And once they became part of Robinson and they bought in, achievement is starting to go up. We now have tutors from George Mason coming over and working with our ESOL kids, and it's gonna make a difference. We've also sent a teacher down to sixth grade to start working with those kids so that when they walk in, in seventh grade, we have a relationship with those ESOL students. It's really about the relationship too. If you can build that, then you bring best practices in, and they feel like they're part of your school, I think we can move the needle. And we're doing similar things for special education. Okay, thank I just, you. I have the last compliment for uh, Mr. Greenfelder. Can you do it in 30 seconds? I can. Okay. Um, he said at the beginning it takes a lot of work um, and people monitoring it. That's the difference. This is the golden child of this program. Um, no, no, no whoever came before. The programs before did not have the accountability. And what we need is the accountability in that, um, and that's what's different about this presentation than maybe other presentations, is you're starting to see the scope 
and then who is going to hold for accountability. So I appreciate you saying that because that's naming the problem and the, and the solution. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. Megan? So uh, I just want to share with my colleagues first that when we had our two by two meetings, um, I, I felt it was extremely important to say to Dr. Brabrand, who yes, had been with us in a different role and was new, that in my six years on the board, um, the work that Mark has been doing, first when I met him at West Springfield, but especially since he's come up to do this project momentum, it, it's incredible. And um, you are a tremendous asset. I figured might as well, you know, embarrass you just a little bit more. Um, but as you're hearing this afternoon, um, there's a lot of excitement because this is something that we know as board members, we've talked about it. We hear it nationally. Every time we go to national school board conference, everyone's trying to figure out how do you find effective means for solving achievement gaps? And you've really, really done it. You and your team and Scott, a shout out to you. I'm sitting here and on slide five, just like when we had our two by twos, you, you're, you're going to do all of this and you're not coming with, you know, a check in hand that the board's got to cut to pay for all of this. I mean, you're, you're reallocating resources so that we don't have to necessarily be choosing this that we really want and need to do. And this that really you, you figured out the, an efficient way for us to try and take a great program and bring it to scale across the county. And I really am so excited to hear my principal, Matt Eline, talk about those relationship connections. I mean, nothing could capture it better because the bottom line for a lot of our students is that when they start to feel that connection to their community, then it feels good to go to school. And then they, they start to, um, buy into that culture and in a school like Robinson, it, you know, it's assumed that these kids are coming in buying into a culture of do well in school. But if you come from a background where your parents didn't have that experience and you English is a second language and you might even be just coming from an entirely different country and you're just trying to, to figure out how to get through the day, um, it just, it, this is really important work. Um, so I, I also really want to say that I appreciate many people have said this, but in particular, Ms. Schultz, you you have certainly been a champion on this. And I see our SEPTA um, representative here. And so to our special education PTA advocates, I want to thank you as well for reminding this board and our community. When we talk about achievement gaps, our students with disabilities, our special education students, they are a big piece of our community that we've struggled to close the gap. So I, I appreciate that kind of intentional focus. We certainly have been very mindful about poverty and that is such an extreme component to, to all of this work as well. Um, my only constructive feedback is on um, slides seven and nine. Um, as I've mentioned, I'm a social worker by training. I read the language on seven and nine, and there's a lot of educational jargon in there mm -hmm. um, that I felt like after six years, I can sort of tease out what you're telling me. But if you, I, I don't know, find somebody or if you want me to go offline and talk you through them, but I mean, bullet point after bullet point, I'm like, oh, the regular person reading that would be like structured response to intervention protocols. I have no idea what they do. I mean, the layperson would look at that and go, I don't know what that means. It sounds good, but I, I kind of would like Very if we... educated, doesn't it? Yeah, but I mean, I just like the idea that I want this to be accessible to our community. Right. And so maybe if there's a way that we can add a little bit more context. You, should, should we make the next step consider uh, adding, providing plain language for slides seven and nine? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, how best to do it, but or maybe you, you start with that bullet point and then maybe in parentheses give a little more, like, layperson translation. But it's just an idea that for people to appreciate what you're actually saying we're doing, um, I, I think I'd like to be able to also be more effective when I'm out in the community talking about some of this stuff. Okay. And I don't want to give them jargon that they just glaze over and say, not sure what that means. Other than that, just thank you. Thank you. I have schools in Braddock district that know we don't hit the threshold of 
30% or 25%. But I mean, I have plenty where we are close to 25 to 30% and we're not labeled Title I. We don't have these resources. And we, I see the students coming through and Eric, you're my guy and Frost and, and Matt with Robinson Secondary. I mean, on paper, you guys are like dream schools, but you know you've got students that this kind of targeted work is going to really help the teachers and most importantly, the students. So great work. And I'm just so excited by what I've seen here today. Thank you, Megan. I think Dr. Brand wanted to say something. I was just going to say for a board, this is our theory of change. This is our theory, and now you're just saying, how do we articulate it in language that our community can understand? How do we get schools better? These are the ways that we get schools better. And so putting that in language that our parents and community members can understand, and we're trying to take it, you've heard, right? Matt has to go see Mark. Uh -uh. We're going to have it scaled that everybody can get to this good stuff. We have regional leadership that's helped. You know, you hear Kathy saying, oh, I've got to go to a school. I would have never gone to a Title I. Who could be doing it better, right? A green school that actually could learn from a school that might have been in prior years a yellow or even a red. That's the, that's the game-changing mindset that we need, need to do when we're really creating systematic collaboration around these, these theories of change across the whole system, not a subset of schools that got a label from the state but our entire system. And so uh, I, we can certainly work on how to figure out how to communicate that better out to external folks. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so I won't repeat a lot except to thank you for being here and um, for the work you're doing. And um, obviously, I mean, I, since my first meeting with Mark, this is impressive work and, and what the principals have done. Um, I want to echo a little bit of what we're hearing today about HR and staffing and some of the anxiety that I hear from principals when that time comes around. And so I guess I'm wondering and would maybe love to hear from some of you, I know you only have five minutes, is as we're looking at policies or ways to change how we do that and taking this approach I guess more holistically of equity, HR, Mark's office, which I also want to know exactly where it's located, um, works together. Can we come up with an approach and, and from a principal standpoint, what would help if I'm, for instance, telling a middle school principal who's used staffing from one area to create a pseudo SOSA because he thought that was really necessary, right? If we're going to take some of that away or principals who say, I understand what HR is telling me, but I know from my past three years that these are the numbers I will have, and I'm gen sorry, generally pretty accurate, and these are the numbers I will have in January, right, that maybe HR is not seeing with the mobility. So I guess, can, we, can you recommend to us when it comes to that staffing for next year, as we're changing so much and expanding to all of our schools, how, can, how will HR work or can work with your office to say, this is how we're going to address your staffing needs. Right. I want to make one comment. Needs-based staffing is over $43 million. Is that right, Chase? Marty, $43 million for needs-based yes. staffing? Yes. $43 million, we're talking about $3 million out of $43 million. <laughs> right? Actually, I'm sorry, office-based staffing, needs-based staffing is only a million. It generates office staffing, but we're talking the, the large amount of staffing we are leaving untouched, small amounts, but we think can have a big lever. The, the larger discussion out of this subset is how does all of our staffing, AAP program staffing, needs-based staffing, general ed staffing, class size caps, how does that all overlay? And how is HR had a leadership lens, an equity lens on how all that overlays. We've maybe never had that discussion with the board. How does it all play out? Because it could be a next step, but since we have all of you here today, I don't know, or if you can give me, what do I say to a principal who says, oh my gosh, they're taking away these positions next year, right? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that HR has been incredibly easy to work with. So um, certainly we could have a whole nother work session about what I personally think we need to do about staffing um, to make it equitable. Chase loves That's that. That's the next step. <laughs> I'll be your chair for that committee and I'll show up every time with a lot of questions. Um, 
But at this point, just in terms of this small change, I do feel like our RAS really listened to us. And I, I don't know if I can speak for everybody, but our RAS listened to us, our HR specialist listens to us. I think there's a lot of things built in to make sure that we get what we need for our schools. I'll just say, you know, Chase has done a lot in his short time here to make it as, uh, and, and the people that work with him, as painless as it possibly can be. It's always an anxious time. Um, but I think one of the benefits around this model is, and I, I kind of want to circle back a little bit to the point you made about silos, is I think one of the benefits here is I envision these folks working together. They, they will be almost like their own CLT collaborating. I know Dr. Duran and Sloan will have them working and Mark will have them working closely together. So they are then spreading out to us and getting that getting these good best practices in our hands and we can slot them in. And again, to what Megan was saying earlier, school like ours, we weren't reaping, we, we have gaps and we have, and we, we do, and we have um, a large special education population. I have two um, special education programs in my building and I have phenomenal teachers, but we can always get better and we need to learn better and, and it, finding ways for them to collaborate um, is huge. So this model helps with that um, staffing season is is always anxious and we're talking about things all the time in terms of how to do that better the, the special education staffing formulas all those things um, but I don't know that that like Penny said I, I could sit here all day and talk about that piece of the pie I'm on the committee with Penny if she's uh, in I'm in <laughs> and, and I want to make sure that everyone is having that experience right that um, knows how to work and, and with HR and, and what that means. So, I, and, and Matt, by the way, excellent, not just students coming in, ESOL students, but I've heard great things about kids coming into your pyramid from outside who felt really integrated. So that culture you're creating, all about it. Thank you. Ms. Strauss. Thank you. Um, I think that this, this vision is excellent, and I applaud you all for coming up with it. Um, and I fully support it, and we are going to have to give some in order to get this staffing. And we've watched project-based uh, program momentum, and it works. And we know that the kind of content support, because that's really what you're seeing, is actual teaching and learning in classrooms and content. Um, we have not had this kind of support in 25 years. We lost it. And, um, you know, we've raised class size, we've cut p support positions, we've, you know, tried many different ways to somehow get back and support schools. And um, it's interesting what Ms. Hines said, and, and, you know, great example of what it's like to have collaborative teams within your own school, and then you need professional help. And uh, it's uh, Ms. Quigley at Franklin Sherman, where we do have a large special education population. We've always had it. And yet, how can, what can we learn from another school? Do we have an opportunity to find another solution that we just simply didn't know? It wasn't that we didn't care. We just didn't know. And how do you get it? And this kind of a, an arrangement of current staff that we have I think gives us an opportunity to try to be really very strategic. And the work is not easy. We continue to have changes in student demographics. Um, it would be, if we, if we had all the money in the world, we'd have tiny class sizes. We would have, you know, huge classrooms for everybody and la, 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 but we don't have all that. So, um, uh, but I think this will drive us in, in a much better place. So I fully support it. And I thank you all very much for coming up with it. I, I really think it'll get us further down the road in a way that, that has frustrated us for a long time. When it comes to actual staffing, as particularly at those August staffing meetings where it gets tense. And I do think the rest, I think people work hard to try to understand what are the real needs of each school and sometimes each grade level. And there's always flexibility and it is always hard to project what have you got in September? What are you going to have by the end of October? What are you going to have in January? And what happens in March if we have exhausted the, the uh, um, staffing reserve? So those are every year challenges that we have. I do believe that when we um, come to finalize the budget, there will be questions on staffing reserve. 
And because I know we robbed it some when we, when the school board, we did that. And um, I had some questions as to whether or not we were taking too much out. Um, so, but those are, those are questions that have to be asked every single year. And it has nothing to do with this particular plan or um, some of our staffing models. So I think it's an excellent way to go. And again, thank you all very much. Um, we'll be looking forward to as we look at the strategic plan and we look at the metrics and we've just looked at at the equity plan so I think we're putting together some uh, I think a formula that gives us another opportunity to to improve outcomes for kids so uh, go for it thank you okay we have one go back with mr. Moon. yeah I seldom ask for go back but just for 30 seconds for mr. Mary line thank you for sharing Thank you for sharing with us what's going on at Robinson, especially with the Easter kids, making them feel as a part of the school and making them feel comfortable and, and being able to become more successful. As a former ESR, ESS student who came to the U.S. as high school students, the biggest reason I would say that I had been successful there in high school was I had two native speakers who took me under their wings, took me around to all these school events, and it said, I made me feel so comfortable. Thank you, Mr. Moon. I think we're ready for next steps. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say much other than you guys said what I wanted to say. Can I finish up with one quick comment? Well, I'm gonna wrap it up and then you can say something. Then I will, okay. okay. Um, and so I'm willing to try this process because it looks like it can work, and I'm also willing because it looks like we're going to have accountability. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to thank, um, again, at all the board members for your support. Um, it really means a lot, but I, I really do want to emphasize um, this has been an extremely collaborative effort. So it's nice to be the face of it. Um, to be honest, it makes you feel good, but I would not be genuine if I didn't say there was a whole lot of people, great principals, um, we work far more collaboratively with IS than people may think. Sloan is a big part of this work. Over half my staff worked for Sloan, um, and that's where they gained their expertise under his leadership, and they are a big part of what I do, and Francisco was a, a big mentor in coming up with this plan and coming up how we could roll it out and had some phenomenal ideas. I think this is going to be great for our regional assistant superintendents and our executive principals. They have been um, very much involved in this and are very much a part of the success. And I would certainly be remiss if the person who started it all, um, you know, and that's Dr. Lockhart, you know, four years ago when he helped Shepard, um, Terry Dade and I to start to begin this thinking and the members of this board um, that helped support us in our work. That's where all this comes from. So again, I, I, I'll feel good driving home, but there's a whole lot of people in this system. This is about Fairfax County, about doing what's right for kids, and this is about the collective good of what happens when we get a lot of really smart people in the room together and we come up with what works and what and and holding ourselves accountable. So I'm just glad to be a part of that team, and we're going to make it more collaborative and better than it's ever been before. Um, I just know we're going to do that under Dr. Braybrand's leadership, and I'm excited for the future. So thank you. Can we do next steps now? Okay. Number one. Aaron, are you? No, okay. it's more than that. It's uh, take a look at the distribution of the regions or the makeup of the regions. So that they are more reflective of a socioeconomic balance. Or we don't concentrate most of the poverty in two regions. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Is everybody okay with number one? I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I it means that. we should be look at, taking a fresh look at how our five regions are divvied up to make sure that, you know, it, 
if we are taking a look at the resources and giving the exact same amount of resources from OSS for each region, then each region should be balanced in what, it, um, what its needs are. And currently, you have a concentration of all of your Title I schools, or the majority of your Title I schools, in two regions. And three regions don't have a responsibility for that type of, or those challenges. But are you and proposing so, redrawing the regions? I want to have a fresh look and maybe uh, let the superintendent come back and say, we think that the regions are perfectly fine, or no, maybe we need to take a fresh look at the regions. I, I would not vote for this. I, honestly, I think we've had enough structural change um, over the last couple of years that 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 embarking on another, I mean, uh, th th this is a massive project. Okay. I, 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 this is not a next step in my opinion. This is an equity issue. Okay, uh, I think Pat wants to speak to that. Yeah, I just, I don't disagree that there's a question here, but I don't see it as a next step. It's an enormous question that gets to Scott's idea about how to manage, you know, administration throughout the system. I, I'm only saying, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I don't, I would not, I don't think we should piggyback it on this conversation as a next step. I think rather maybe it's something we bring up separately and have a longer discussion about, that's all. Uh, I actually would have to say I agree with that. Um, Ms. Evans? I say, why not get the factual data on it and say, you know, what, uh, in terms of the regions, what what's what is the socioeconomics, and then we can, if we want to go farther with it, we can go farther with it. Why not just ha ask for some factual information about what what is currently, yeah, get get something in the Bray brand briefing. So not to change it, but just provide information on the current, uh, the current demographics of each region. I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with how it relates to the discussion, the topic, but Dr. Brabrand, did you want to? Well, it directly does, relates. Because, because we're, we're, we're looking at adding resources by region. And so okay. that's the question. If we're going to add resources by region, where are we adding resources? Dr. Brabrand, did you want to speak to that? I, I don't want to divide the board on a topic. Uh, you did my mid-year, and, and I'm a get to yes guy. So I, I'll relook at anything. I wasn't here. I wasn't here when you went from eight to five, and I'll be honest, in my first year, I felt like scrambling the deck. You can rearrange the chairs on the Titanic and the ship is still going, and not that we're the Titanic, but you get the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait. Yeah, okay, hold on, let me try a different metaphor. It is Just Let me try a different, let me try a different thing. Just changing the seats sets people in a whole different direction instead of saying, look, right, so, I can certainly give you the region stuff. I need to do a lot more to find out what my predecessor did in developing the regions and understanding how that happened, and I'll be glad to do it, and maybe from some of you board members I'll be able to know, and that might inform future thinking, um, and I'm, I'll, I'm happy to do that. I, I don't want that to impact what we brought you today right. and, as, and that's kind of my view. As a strategy. How do other people feel about this? So why don't we just take a vote? Who would support this? Getting the information. Getting the information. Three, four, five. I think that's okay. We'll take we'll take moon time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Again, what is demo how how much of the demographics like what are you asking for? And like how much of demographics do you want? I mean do, I mean how many students, what is the level of poverty, how many schools uh, per region so that you know you see whether or not it's actually getting the same, you know, does each region have the but same level of challenges? versus um, the resources being allocated. And so what we're talking about is making sure that we provide um, a, a insurance of quality programming and fidelity of implementation collaborative teams to support each of the regions, but not each of the regions is gonna have the same level of challenges as they currently are laid out, so. We didn't have the same conversation when we were talking about the equity position in the previous conversation. Well, so. because we're not, ta we're talking about 
Right, they're all, but there's kids in all regions, and uh, so if we're so now the question, do needs-based staffing of, of the needs-based staffing, I, I, no, that's not what I'm asking okay. for. Can we, can we stop? I think um, we just need to make a vote, take a we vote. We did. No, well, Mr. Moon asked for time to read. Right. We gave him time to read. Are you ready? Are you done reading? Okay. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> Staff to five people. Self-control is leaking away. No. <laughs> okay. So how many people can support this? Getting the information. Getting the information. Okay, I think we're doing that. N and number two. So that was uh, lost more than one, uh, will lose more than one office position by the new formula. Yeah, we can combine with Mr. Moon's. Uh, I have a list of schools that will lose more than one office position, if any. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Again, can I, can I just ask a question? I feel like I'm gonna channel like Past, okay. past work sessions and next steps. To what end are we getting this information? I, and I don't know how much we're asking you to do. That's the other thing is, are we asking for new reports? Is this something that you can just- No, it's a list of schools and I believe Mr. Greenfelder has it. asking yeah. Dr. I, Braybrand. I think, I think we have the information. I, okay. I, I've heard strong consensus that we can move forward, but I also wanting the board wanting to be proactive and have information okay. available to you and I'm going to get that information. I think Mark or I or Steve has it on some we, file. We, we, have, we, we have, have the list, but I would want anything like that to come from Chase to you all. I don't want to send out a list of Mark, Mark, uh, staffing. Mark, sorry. Send it That's to me. Come. Mark, send it to me. I'll take care of getting okay, it out. Send to the it board. to you. So I'd rather throw Chase under the bus. I can't whistle. Okay. Are most people okay with number two? All right. I, I understand you have an objection, but I think that's the only I'm objection. Just worried, I'm worried that we're going to now start elevating the certain schools and now say, well, they lost a position, and we've just No, but that's okay. okay. We, we have to look at the information and then make a determination. Number three. I think what? retained. Isn't it, that the same? Well, retained. No, this is very different. And uh, Chase, you might want to help me out with this. Um, uh, re reduced uh, from the positions um, according to the needs base according to needs based staffing. Th this re this relates to general staffing, correct, Sandy, or does it really it's, or it's all directed to? Uh, but not related to Mark's plan. You mean not to Mark's plan? No, so this is a this is a general kind of right staffing question from last year. Right. Okay. From last year. Yeah, last year. Okay. How many schools? Um, so, so I think really retained is not the right word. So though. I think, I think the reduced the, from the from the needs based staffing formula. Okay. I would just say from the original allocation. From, okay, from the original allocation of needs based staffing. Yeah. I know what she means. Yeah. You know what I mean. Okay. That's good. Okay. 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 Is everybody okay with number three? Yep. No. I I don't I I. I'm, I actually don't agree with you. I think that she's asking for information. It's not undoing anything. We can certainly get the information if people agree with that and then make a determination if necessary. So is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, thank you. Number four. So I don't know if this is a next step or if it's just we need to think about that. I, I, I'm, uh, okay. maybe, maybe that we remove that and just, you know, everybody understand that I'm thinking about that. Okay. All right, number four. Uh, just a slight modification of the language. Could, could I have a provide a list of schools that will be affected by office staffing changes and a list of schools that have converted office staff? You could. Okay. Well, Yes. Is is everybody okay with that? Oh, young, okay. does that does that does read make, properly? You you, you want to read that over again staff? and see if that's really? You want to know how many people had converted office staff and now I, I want to know them. all the information. Oh, you want to know which, all yeah, okay. which which schools will be okay. losing office staffing and also which schools have converted to teachers and then lose teachers. Okay. All right, are we good with that one? Yep. Okay, and number five. Yep. 
That's kind of how you say it. User-friendly language, I don't know. Okay, all right, are we okay with number five? Okay, all right, we are going to try to Uh, Ms. Evans, I, I would share, I mean, we, we could start, some of our staff members didn't expect it to go this late. They had child care things that would okay. have been presenting. I know we have a slot for the BA lanes on Thursday that I've moved because I met with them for a town hall last week and I wanted a little bit more time to be thoughtful before okay. bringing that to the board to listen to their feedback. So we have a slot for the strategic plan on Thursday. I. I I would throw out to the board, we've had a full day, if we could do that strategic plan slot where we had the BA lanes on Thursday, and if we need additional uh, work session time after Thursday, we can schedule it. I mean, the strategic oh. plan we've done multiple times, so. Does everybody like that proposal? Yes. Does anybody want to just stay? Okay, wait, no, so I have a question. We've ordered pizza, whether or not we want to. <laughs> oh, look at Ryan came back. Yes. Whether or not we want to begin to do an hour's worth on the strategic plan or not. That was my initial, was yes. to get through. We had planned A to just bit. do the first portion of it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and um, if I may add a concern that I do have, so we're prepared to have the presentation today, but we have several staff members who would be able to provide uh, information around the desired outcomes. And so without those staff members here, I think that it might, mm. the, the conversation may not be as rich okay. if we didn't have those staff members here. And again, they had scheduled a one o'clock presentation and not a <laughs> 5.30 presentation. Uh, so, Quite different. <laughs> so they do have, they do have uh, other obligations with family this evening uh, with uh, child care. Uh, I understand. Mr. Moon, did you have something to say? Uh, just, uh, just, just asking uh, whether uh, Mr. Smith or somebody else could give us maybe overview broad rather than going into little detail of all the you know measures and baseline data well, let, me, et let me ask the body what they would like to do miss evans yeah I, I just wanted to mention that uh, unfortunately i'm going to be out of town on thursday so um but obviously we we have to put the uh topic when we can so if if we are going to move it to thursday then um, I will um, write up my remarks and hopefully uh, somebody can carry them and, and they can be considered. I did have a couple of suggestions of things that I wanted to change from what's in there now. Okay, are you comfortable with that, Ms. Evans? Okay, and so is the group, am I hearing a consensus that we don't wanna stay together and, and sing Kumbaya and eat dinner? Did you have something? Yeah, I mean, I I disagree with that. I mean, Marty might ha not have some of his staff here, but there have been staff that have been sitting here for six hours waiting for this. So, okay. um, I don't know. It's it, I would I would leave it up to Marty to be honest, because he's going to have people. Okay, on Marty's got the power. <laughs> uh, well, again, given the presentation, if Mr. Moon would like a, a an overview, I could certainly give that. Uh, as we think about the work that we're doing with the language with the desired outcomes, which is the first part that we would be, be talking about, uh, we could uh, walk through that as best we could. But again, I don't know if we could have all of your answers or questions answered around how the desired outcome language was developed because those goal champions were, were responsible for that language. Okay, Ms. Hines wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I just want to ask Marty, so if we asked you to stay for a little bit and give us an overview, would that save us time on Thursday or are you going to do the same overview on Thursday? Uh, I, I could, it, it probably wouldn't save us that much time. Okay, thank you. I think we should just wait till Thursday. Well, if anybody's here. Are they voting by absence? No. <laughs> okay, who, who wants to stay? Can I just see a hand of that? Okay, well, oh, there's three people. Who's <sighs> in I don't know. Where did they go? That's three. Uh, Madam, Madam Meeting Manager, we just take a vote amongst those who are at the table and then, and then go. It's going to be three to three. You didn't oh, it's have a your three hand up, three? did you, Karen? We have. Okay, so how many want to go? Okay. Okay. That's four. Go. All right, thank you. Good night. <laughs> there is pizza. 